Hi everyone, thanks for coming along. Thanks for listening to me. Really appreciate it. Um, so, the talk is about systems and processes that enable growth. Um, I don't think that I have all the answers, that I know everything, but what I'm going to try and do is just share what I've been through and the systems and processes that we've evolved to try and create a scalable business. Um, so the dream, every time I speak to one of my friends who aren't in technology, they all think that I want to run a business where I can go and sit on the beach, push a button, and earn lots of money. Unfortunately, when you have 40, 50 people, uh, you've got customers, uh, you're delivering products, uh, we're an e-commerce company, so we can't get away from that. It's really difficult. You can't go and sit on the beach in the Bahamas and push a button and everything kind of just happens. What you can do is you can push a button which allows your business to scale so that you end up doing work which is more challenging and more interesting and more valuable instead of just doing data capture and manual work all the time. So that's kind of the dream, I think. So before we go any further, let me do some sense checking so I can kind of get a sense of what stories I should tell. Um, how many of you work in e-commerce? Quite a few, okay. Uh, SaaS, quite a few. Um, building an app, okay. How many of your service providers? All right. Um, how many of you been around for for less than a year? One and two years, two and three, three to five, longer. Okay. So why are you guys here? <laughs> um, number of people. Okay. So who of you have got less than five people? Uh, 5 and 15, 15 and 30, 30 to 60 plus. Okay, cool. So hopefully there's a lot of stuff in here that's relevant for everybody, um, which I hope it does. So just some context, I'm a zoologist, I'm not a technologist, I, I trained as a, a scientist and a zoologist, so whenever, whenever I look at stuff, I see ecosystems. So I see kind of how things interact with each other, and that's how I've tried to build the business, um, by creating ecosystems that work with each other. My idea of fun is taking photo photos of elephants and rhinos. That's kind of the background I come from. Um, that kind of gives you an idea of what kind of person I am, what I like to do in my spare time. Um, in terms of we do, we, we started out in Passion Capital. Any of you guys know Passion Capital at all? And, and Wiper Yard out in Farringdon. Um, okay, so have a look at them online. Um, they're an incubator space. We were there for two years. In the first two years, there were four of us. So we worked around a desk, you know, much like this for, for two years, just building out our technology and trying out different ideas. Um, after that, we grew to eight people pretty quickly, um, and then from there, we grew from eight to 40 people in 24 months, and that was pretty challenging. Um, so a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about is, is really about that experience. We are now in Oval, uh, in a nice office. Uh, we have a store in Colchester. Um, that's our brand, but I'm not really here to talk about our brand and what our company does as much as what we do underneath all of that, because I think that's probably what you're more interested in. Um, that's a team in December. Uh, that's our store in Colchester. That's us on opening day, uh, 10,000 square foot of, of kind of furniture retail space. And what we do is we ship heavy stuff around the country in vans like that. That's kind of our core business. And so this is what I've learned so far. So the underlying kind of thing I want to get across here is that systems and automation are the lever that you use to create sustainable growth. So it's really easy to throw cash into a hole and grow really quickly, but that's not sustainable because all you're going to do is burn cash. Um, and that's not sustainable unless you've got really, really wealthy backers. So what you've got to do is try and figure out how to create systems and automation that allows you to grow in a way that lets your overheads decrease. Right? So your growth is going like that and your overheads are going like that. That's what I think of as sustainable growth. So if you can achieve that, you've got a sustainable business and hopefully a scalable business, because there's a difference between growth and scale. Um, I think Rory talked about that this morning, um, and for me that's a really important thing to remember. Um, so basically what I've done is I've split the talk into four parts. So the first part is a framework, and this is kind of an idea that I've started developing. The second one is opportunities that you guys might want to look at to try and systematize your business. Um, then I've got some examples. So these are things that we've been through personally. Um, and then I've got some do's and don'ts, um, which hopefully might ring true as well. So what I've started calling this is Maslow's hierarchy of systems for startups. So just like Maslow's hierarchy for people, you've got a hierarchy in startups that makes a lot of sense. And what this does, in my mind, just gives me a place to start when I start thinking about how I'm going to change things. And underlying all of that, I have this kind of general idea that done is better than perfect. So I've just asked one of the guys on my team to 
to do something for me this morning. He replied back with this long email, you know, why he should do it and why somebody else shouldn't do it. He's going on holiday tomorrow. So that means in two weeks' time, while he's on holiday, that job isn't going to get done because he doesn't want that other person to do it because he thinks he's going to get it done better. But I want the job done, and I want it done by tomorrow. So in my mind, the important thing is to remember that done is better than perfect. So first kind of part of the, the framework is what you want to do is increase visibility. So how many of you know your metrics intimately every single day? Put your hands up. Hi. OK, so how many of you don't know your metrics every single day? All right, so that's a problem. So if you don't know what your metrics are, and you don't know where you're going and where you've come from, how can you change it? How can you improve it? If you're only looking at your metrics every month or every three months, then you're going to be a month to three months behind the improvement that you need to make. So I think what you've got to do is you've got to create a, uh, a set of um, charts or dashboards or uh, spreadsheets, whatever you want to use, to give you the visibility so that you can see things clearly without having to go and dig into the detail every single day. So the, the kind of premise for this is that if you want to spend six hours a day doing a spreadsheet just to give you that data, you're doing something wrong. That's taking too long because you can't spend six hours a day creating spreadsheets. The next thing you want to do is you want to reduce friction. So I kind of have a principle in mind where I kind of see an ecosystem and wherever there's friction, wherever something happens that takes too long, or there's too many pieces of communication that have to happen between the task, sorry, the request for the task and then the task, or where too many people have to get involved, or where there's too many meetings, or where there's just general chaos, that's friction. And what you want to do is reduce that friction so that you don't, um, that you're not slow, right? You're, you're fast. So anything that slows you down has got to get rid of. Um, and you've got to do that ruthlessly, because if you don't do that, what's going to happen is it will slow you down, and then you'll hit a wall. Once you've done that, so once you've kind of increase visibility and you reduce friction, the next thing you want to do is create leverage. So when I think of leverage, I think of the ability to take a person or a process or a system and make that do more on its own than it did before. It's a very simple explanation, but um, you know, it's this concept of saying, well, how can I take this process that previously took me two hours and turn that into something which will take me five minutes? And in doing that, I've then created another two hours of time in my day. Does that make sense? Nod your head. All right, so I'm kind of making sense now. So what you want to do is you want to figure out a process or a system that gives you that leverage. And once you've done that, you want to offload it to junior people. You don't want to be doing it yourself. Because if you're doing it yourself, you're going to spend a lot of your time doing that work when you should actually be thinking about the progress of the business. So figure out the process, offload it to junior people, manage it, but make sure you offload it. Make sure it doesn't stay on your plate. Once you've created some leverage, you're going to start saving time. And I think when you start saving time, you can actually start scaling intelligently. So what you, and you want to do this front to back. When, I'm, when I say front to back, I kind of feel like it's the most important thing to start streamlining customer processes first, and then back end processes last. Because ultimately, you want to make your customer processes as simple, as fast, as seamless, as great as possible, because that's what's going to generate value for your business. Once you've got that right, you want to make sure that your back end processes are the same. So some simple examples, uh, you want to report weekly. If that reporting of you know, your weekly numbers takes you six hours on a Monday morning, you want to turn that into two hours. And then after that, you want to turn that into five minutes. And that's going to make it a lot easier for you to get your numbers out. If it takes you 20 minutes to process an order, so when we first started our business and we were using Magento, it would take us 30 minutes to process a single order through Magento through our whole system. All right? So if you're getting 80 orders a day and you multiply that by 30 minutes each, pretty soon you've got a people problem. Okay? So we had to figure out how to make that processing of orders much, much faster. Um, same thing for processing accounts. Um, the, the, the way our, our kind of business works is that we take an order in Magento, it gets sent via SagePay to the bank, and then everything gets processed and everything's okay, and then it comes back to Magento. Then we do a fraud check, then it comes back, and only after the fraud check is done can we think of the order as processed and complete. Um, and that takes a hell of a long time. Now, we've managed to reduce that time to 15 minutes, um, which means that our people can get through more orders quicker every day. Um, then there's more stuff like updating or editing data. And this data could be anything that's in your business. There's deploying to production. Um, how many of you deploy your code via FTP? Do you even know what that is? OK, how many of you have technical people who tell you that they deploy their code via FTP? Put your hand up high. <laughs> OK, how many of you have an automated deployment process? And what is that? Is that an SVN up? 
Is it a is it a like a, a Git deployment? Do you use something like Jenkins? Do you have an actual automated process, or is this kind of a homegrown thing where you have some scripts that run in the background? Jenkins. Jenkins. All right. So Jenkins is really good. Yeah. We, we wrote our own. It's called Bot. It's part of Bot. Cool. So. That, for me, if you're running a tech business or a tech-based business, that's one of your most important things. Because if you can't roll a feature out and then roll back really quickly if there's a problem, you're going to have big problems. Because if you make the assumption that a deployment is never going to go wrong, then you're doing something wrong. It's always going to go wrong somewhere along the line, and you're going to have to roll back. So that automation of deployments is incredibly important, especially where it involves cash. Um, then the next thing is adding products, data, or features. So you want to make that really fast as well. So how many of you deploy to your sites or to your systems uh, once a month, once a week, once a day. Okay, what about the rest of you? Don't know? Every two weeks. Okay, so here's another thing, right? You generally don't want to deploy on a Monday and you don't want to deploy on a Friday, but you do want to deploy Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So speak to your tech teams and find out how often you do deployments and whether you're doing big deployments or whether you're doing small deployments and, and how often it's taking you to get new features out. Because at the end of the day, I think that product, and this is the product that your customer sees, whatever it is, is the best growth hack that you can possibly have. If your product's crap, no one's going to want to buy from you. So you've got to make a good product. And having a good product means you've got to do releases often to improve it. So then you've got to have automated deployments to support that. So if you go down the, ch the, the chain or the stack, what you get to is uh, the ability to be nimble or to be agile or to be fast. And that's really, really important. So saving time is probably the most important thing that you're going to get out of all of these different processes in the end. And once you've done that and you're starting to save time, you can then start to optimize your team. Right? So one of the problems we had in the beginning is that I had a lot of people doing a lot of manual work every single day. And that was because our systems and our processes didn't support them doing automated work. So we had a lot of manual data capture. And it's literally taking one set of data from one screen, copying and pasting it into another system in another screen, and then saying on the next screen that it had been completed. Now, that's an incredibly inefficient use of time. So what we've done is we've built systems that automate all of that, and we've taken our team and we've started giving them work which is more fulfilling and which is more knowledge-based instead of just processing-based. And they're much happier. So the net result is that people have uh, been given opportunities for career growth. And that's resulted in increased salaries, and that's resulted in better happiness, which is a long way away from where we were when I was at the last, this last event last year. So the underlying principle here is be nimble. Always be nimble. If you're not nimble, then something's wrong. Because most of us are in small companies that are competing against big companies. And probably the only thing that we have in our favor is speed. Right? OK, so opportunities for systems. So the first thing is communication. So I've been in quite a few different companies, and I've, I've kind of worked with lots of different types of people. And one of the things I've really started thinking about a lot is this idea that there's a difference between an idea, a project, a task, information, data, and wisdom. And what you really want to do is you want to try and split all of them out. Because if you see them as the same thing, what will happen is that you'll start getting confused. And you'll take an idea that you had last night in the shower, and you'll turn that into a task which isn't achievable when actually it's a project. Okay, and so communication is the central hub by which all of this happens. And if you don't get your communication right and you don't use the right tool for the job, you're going to create mass confusion. And that's going to result in chaos. So you don't want to do that. So you need to figure out how to get your communication right internally and externally so that it makes sense for everybody. One of the best ways to do this is to get rid of email. So how many of you process 100 emails a day? 150? 200? 300, 400. How many of you like email? You like email? Okay, how many of you really like email, like really get it? How many of you spend your weekends doing email? When you get to your deathbed, are you going to think, gee, I wish I had have answered more emails? <laughs> right? None of us feel like that anymore. In the early days, getting an email was pretty cool. You, know, you got an email from Aunt Mavis in Australia, and, and you felt quite privileged because you got a letter from her that was personal. Nowadays, you get so much email that you feel like it's this constant barrage of stuff just hitting your, your computer. And I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And in the early days of our business, I had inherited people that had an email culture in their previous companies. So I had to work incredibly hard to remove email from our culture. So I'm happy to say that I went on a stag do this last weekend, which is my stag do. I came back to 20 emails. And I felt liberated. Because a year ago, I would have come back to probably 300 emails, and I would have had to spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out what was going on. 
And then all I had to do was look through my task system and figure out what had been assigned to me. And within half an hour, I'd figured out what my priorities were and what I had to do. And that felt liberating because it's a very different place to where I used to live three or four years ago. So bottom line is don't rely on email. Uh, if you do, rely on it at your peril. Focus on execution and reducing the friction between tasks instead of the communication of tasks. How many of you use an X drive in your, in your company? How many of you have got like a machine that just stores all of your stuff? How many of you use Dropbox? OK, so they're doing a good job. Um, so I think this is a fairly redundant point for many of the people that have put their hands up. Bottom line is just use Dropbox for business. Don't even worry about file sharing. That's something that should never create friction. When you get too big for it, buy a NAS that costs 800 pounds and be done with it. But that's something that shouldn't get in our way anymore with the technology that's out there. How many of you have a workflow system? And what does that do? Yep. Okay. So you're from Pivotal? That's right. All right, cool. Pivotal's a good product. You put your hand up, what do you use? Asana. Asana. How many of you use Asana? Put your hand up. All right, do you guys like it? So, so. Okay. How many of you use Basecamp? What else do you use? Pivotal, Basecamp, Asana, what else have we got in the room? Jira. Jira? Jira. Yeah. Trello? Trello's pretty cool. Uh, and, and email? How many of you use email to manage tasks? And then you have emails with like 30 threads on them for a single task. Okay, so we've started using Asana in our business, and I'm happy to say that everybody loves it. It's a really great tool. Have a look at it. The, the, the kind of thing I want to get across here is that it's a central place that keeps all of our tasks. So at any point in time, I can look at anybody in our business and any project in our business, and I can figure out exactly what's going on in about 30 seconds because everything is in one place. And this is from code commits all the way through to fundraising and hiring and firing people. So this is something that gets quite challenging, is that we all develop loads and loads of data. And this could be customer data, it could be company data, it could be sales data, it doesn't really matter what it is. The important thing to hear is to look at each piece of data as a single field in the database. And that's it. And because it's a single field in a database, it can be retrieved, it can be sliced and diced. You can look at it, you can do pivots, you can do lookups, you can do lots of different things on that. So what you've got to do is get away from this idea that your data is sacred and try and figure out ways to export it, get it into spreadsheets, and then get wisdom from that data. That's going to give you the information to create systems and processes which help you speed things up. So this is one of my personal kind of lessons which actually came out of the last time I was here, which we did a lot of work around to change internally. We were at a point at one stage where we were getting between 150 and 300 CVs per position that we were recruiting for. And that was all coming in via email. So somebody had to sit there and sift through 150 to 300 CVs, read them, figure out who the top five were, and then start organizing all of our recruiting. That feels like a hell of a lot of work. So we started looking around for different tools that were going to work for us. We started off using Resumator, and then we ended up with Workable, because it's a really simple and easy to use system. But what we've done underneath that is we've created a hiring system which is repeatable, which everybody understands and everybody in the business knows. And what that's doing is it's taking 300 CVs at the top of the funnel and turning it into five CVs at the bottom of the funnel without anybody having to touch anything. So that means that when our hiring person looks at the CVs, she knows that those five CVs are the best that we could possibly get because the system has done all the work for her. And that makes it a lot easier for her to manage the load that comes through the door. How many of you guys do reporting? Hopefully everybody. OK, so we talked a little bit about this earlier. So the important thing here in terms of systems and processes is to figure out what do you need to report on? How often do you need to report on it? And how can you automate it? What we've done is we've used a combination of Google Docs and then Google Analytics and Gecko Board. So do any of you guys know about Gecko Board at all? Most people nodding their heads. So what's really cool about Gecko Board is that you can point most of your APIs or the tools that you use on the web today, and you can point them to Gecko Board. And Gecko Board will give you a nice dashboard of what's going on. So we use that a lot. We've written some custom stuff for Magento, which puts all of our Magento data into Gecko Board. And so at any point in time, we've got a visual of what our conversion rates are, what our bounce rates are, um, how much revenue we're making, how much it's costing us to get a sale. All of that stuff comes in via Gecko Board, and it's all on screens in the office. So we can see what's going on at any one time. And then that gets rolled up into Google uh, Docs dashboards, which give everybody a view in the business of where we are. So I think that's really, really important. And what that's done is it's taken a week-long process, which was probably two years ago, and turned it into about half an hour on a Monday, which is great. 
How many of you build your own servers? Okay, so we, I've got a, a story to tell just now, but this will kind of be the precursor to it. So in my view, the days of manual server build and config are over. If you've been watching the web in the last couple of days, uh, Google slashed their prices for their cloud infrastructure, and now AWS has matched those prices. So what's happening is we're getting into a pricing war with two of the biggest web giants who are offering cloud infrastructure. So if you're building your own infrastructure today, you shouldn't be, because you've got really cheap alternatives out there that can give you exactly the same hardware for a much, much lower cost without you having to own any physical infrastructure. We built our infrastructure with a guy called John Topper from the Scale Factory. I can make an introduction to anybody who wants to speak to him. Fantastic guy, um, and did a really good job for us. But what he's done is he's been able to, uh, he's helped us to build infrastructure which is truly, truly scalable. And I'll talk about a little problem that we had earlier which proves that. But the point is, is that most of us don't have the skills to do this. So don't make the assumption that you can do it. Just get somebody to help you. Um, accounts is another one that, that's been a big pain point for us. Uh, in the beginning, we did everything manually. We then moved into uh, getting everything out of Magento and trying to do our accounts from that and spreadsheets. And then from there, we started using Xero. We soon grew out of Xero and started using BrightPill. And now we're hitting pain points with BrightPill. So we're probably going to have to move to something else quite soon as well. And that's going to be painful on its own. Um, the point is, is that if your accounts take you a long time, you're not going to get the financial information you know about your business or you need to know about your business quick enough. And that's going to create problems. So accounts is probably the first place you should be looking to automate. And then for us, ERP is really similar uh, or a similar question. Basically, it's understanding where your stock is, where your inventory is, what it's costing you, how quickly you're turning it, all of that kind of stuff. We started trying to do this in Magento. It became really, really difficult. We then tried to do it in BrightPool. They're not doing a very good job of that. So we're doing a lot of spreadsheet work at the moment. So we're going to have to move to an ERP system which is bigger and can handle this. But this is probably the thing that I think is our biggest inflection point as a business, because if we can't get that problem right, we're not going to be able to scale to a point where we can automate our inventory and our stock. And that means we can't compete with our biggest competitors. So that's probably our biggest project in the next year. And then for those of you that do B2B stuff, um, I think a sales process is probably the most important thing that you can, you can go through or you can do, because that sales process is going to give you a repeatable, definable way of thinking about how you get sales and how you generate revenue. And then if you change and tweak that process, you can turn that into better results. So that's probably the first thing to look at if you're a B2B type company. Um, I haven't used Salesforce in probably six or seven years. I don't know what it's like these days, but everybody talks about it, so I'm sure it's pretty good. So I talked a little bit about this earlier. This slide's really just for me to explain like how we've built as, or grown as a business. So it really is a cliche, right? Everybody talks about the cloud. Um, whenever I hear people saying, oh, just use the cloud, especially if they're like 20, 30 years older than me, I feel a little bit kind of um, like I should throw something at them because they don't really know what they're saying. But the point is, is that there's so many services in the, on the web these days that mean you don't have to do that internally that you shouldn't be looking to do those functions in your business internally at all because they're not your core competency. Does that make sense? So for me, a case in point is I hired a guy recently who was at a, an interview for a competitor and they wanted to hire him to build a time management system. So they were going to pay him 60 grand a year to build a time management system. How fucking crazy is that? Right? So you're going to spend $14 a month on a time management system for your entire company, and you're going to pay 60 grand for somebody else to build it for you from scratch. It doesn't make any sense. Sounds like they've got too much cash. Okay? So just to run through these quickly, we, we base most of our internal stuff on Google Mail, Calendar Docs and Wiki. That's how we do most of our documentation and most of our kind of internal collaboration. Uh, and then we use a whole raft of different services. So you can all read them there on the screen. Um, we didn't use all of them from the beginning. We started off with Magento and Dropbox. And now we use all of that. And we use it religiously. And what that's done is it's meant that I can take our entire business and move it into a Regis office next week if I want to. And none of my infrastructure is in, uh, impacted. All I need is an internet connection. So we are kind of reaching that point where I can go and sit on a beach in the Bahamas and push a button. Kind of. Maybe not, but, but kind of. The point is, is that I don't have to worry about the infrastructure anymore. It's all taken care of by other people. So some examples. One of the things that I found really, really difficult is this idea of one team, one dream. So when you hire people who come from different backgrounds, they all have different ways of thinking about things. And so what happens is when you try and create new systems or you try and move them in a specific direction, they resist that because they don't generally like to change. Has everybody experienced that before? How many of us like changing a lot? 
How many of us go like out of our way to change stuff? Not many, right? It's not something we like to do very often. So when you're in a company and you're trying to introduce a new system that changes the way people work, it's incredibly difficult. So I found that part of what we were doing actually more of a psychology exercise than it was an implementation exercise. Because the implementation was easy. But it took me eight weeks to get my team of 20 people onto Asana. Right? Where it would have taken me probably one day to get a tech team onto Asana because they think in a specific way. But you know, Jane from customer service, she doesn't think about tech in a specific way. She just doesn't want to change the way she's been doing stuff for the last five years. So it was incredibly difficult. <coughs> Talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, so this is kind of where I can talk a little bit about what's happened. One of the things that we had, uh, so we had a server environment where we had a, a three server environment on Rackspace, database server, uh, two web servers, a load balancer. And it took Rackspace six months to figure out that they couldn't create a load balancer for us. So that got really frustrating. It took them 30 days to build a, a generic LAMP server for us to grow. So we were getting really, really frustrated. And at one point we decided, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat our infrastructure as a, as a service. We're not gonna treat it as a physical hardware anymore. We're just gonna think of it as a service. So we're gonna write code that writes code for us. And so what happened is we built a stack which enables us to go and roll out our infrastructure onto AWS with a click of a button. And the proof of this is about a week ago, we got hit by six or seven search engines all at once on a Friday night at 10 o'clock. And we went from 120 requests per second to 800 requests per second in about five minutes. So what we did is we pushed a button, we deployed six more servers, and the load went down. Now, six months ago, or nine months ago, that would have brought, brought our business to the knees. Uh, it would have destroyed our machines and we would have had to spend three or four days trying to fix that, which meant we wouldn't have been able to take any revenue because if people have slow pages on our e-commerce website, they don't buy from you. And that's what this one-click deployment has given us. It's given us the ability to roll out our, our whole infrastructure with one click of the button. I'm really proud of that because it's enabled us to move really, really quickly. So the important thing here is not to think of your infrastructure as fixed, but to think of it as a service which you can push and pull as you need to. So again, talking about recruitment funnel, I think this is something that's really interesting. We've been through lots of different ways of recruiting. We started off using our uh, customer service system, email system, desk.com, to receive all the emails and then go from there. We then moved to Resumator. Resumator didn't work so well because it was too complex and there were too many options. And then we moved to Workable, and that's been working really well. So if any of you are thinking about your recruiting system, take my experience, learn from it, and don't do email. Don't do desk, don't do resume, go straight to Workable and just start there. And hopefully that'll be all you need to do. But the point is, is that we had to figure out a, a pretty complex process which involves lots of different questions for uh, candidates. Uh, it, it involves people vetting a CV before other people get to it. Um, and then it inv involves an interview process which is three or four steps long depending on wh what role we're hiring for. And we've automated all of that with Workable. And it costs us 100 bucks a month? Something like that? I don't know. And it's fantastic. So if you have any doubts about that, just go for it and try it. OK, so kind of coming to the end now, some do's, don'ts, and gotchas. Um, hopefully some of these will ring true and make sense. The first thing is do set boundaries. So what I found really difficult is that I made assumptions about what boundaries people thought they had in our business. And what I've discovered over time is that their th thinking around boundaries are not the same as my thinking. And so that's created problems in communication and problems in execution. So what I try to do now before we start anything new is I set very clear boundaries and say, these are your boundaries, these are my boundaries, this is what I expect you to do, this is what success constitutes, these are your KPIs to measure whether you create success or not. And what that's done is it made everybody a lot happier because now they know what boundaries they play within. And that was actually a very uh, defining moment when I realized that my view of what people's boundaries were was different, coming from a tech background, speaking to people who don't come from a tech background. So if you live in that kind of a company, think about that carefully. Next thing, train your team to think in systems, not absolutes. So one of the problems I have in my team is that a lot of people think that the way something is is the way it has to be. I think of things as the way they are, as an evolution. So if something is the way it is right now, that means that tomorrow it can change, if we can figure something better out. But a lot of my team don't think like that. They think that that's the way it is, so that's the way it has to be. So I often go into meetings where people say, but that's the way it is. And then I end up saying, no, it's not the way it is, because tomorrow we can change that. So a good case in point here was I had a, a chat with our um, HR person about Workable. She was fixed on resumes, and she didn't want to move over. And I challenged her with three questions. And I said, OK, tell me how long it takes you to process 20 CVs in Resumator, 
time yourself, and then come back to me and do exactly the same exercise in Workable. And she said to me, how did you know it would take so long? Like, how, how did you know there would be a difference? And I said, well, I've been around the block a few times. I can, I can see it just by the interface. And the, the kind of gotcha moment for her was to think that, well, Resumator wasn't an absolute. We could change from that because it wasn't good enough for us. Does that make sense? Fantastic. Next thing, so use KPIs to measure system performance. So one of the key things for us here was that we took our KPIs and we created kind of a baseline set of data where a KPI was OK. And if it, if it went below that, it was not OK, and alarm bells would go off. If it's above that, we don't worry about it. Does that make sense? So what we're starting to do is instead of dealing with everything, we're dealing with exceptions. And that makes it a lot easier to think about our 75-odd KPIs that we look at. The, the contrast to this is that you have to pick your KPIs carefully because it's really easy to get stuck in this kind of KPI quagmire where you have 150 KPIs of which three only really matter. So really think long and hard about what KPIs really matter for your business and then focus on those. Everything else will fall into place. So what we're getting to at the moment is site speed is probably our number one thing that we have to look at every single day. If that's bad, then everything else suffers. And after site speed, it's conversion rate. And then after that, it's how much money we're spending on advertising. If we get those three things right, the rest of our business does fine. If we don't get those things right, it doesn't matter how many emails I answer, the business isn't going to do well. So that's what we focus on. So the contrast, or the, the kind of flip side of this is that you have to give your team ownership of those KPIs. Because if you own the KPIs and you drive them and you push them and your team don't, what's going to happen is they're going to start resenting you because they don't necessarily feel like they can make the changes that are necessary or give you the input that's necessary to change those KPIs. So what you've got to do is give them ownership, give them autonomy, and then teach them and push them and prod them and cajole them and, and, and kind of get them in the right place. But don't step over them and don't try and push them aside. Let them kind of grow into it. And what will happen, and what I've found, is that when people have gotten why the KPI is there and they've gotten this idea that they can change the KPI if they do things and they can take ownership of that and they own that, then the magical stuff starts happening and that's that they start doing it themselves without me having to ask them. And now three months later, after this kind of magic stuff starting to happen, I have a business where I can go away for a weekend and not fret about stuff because I know that everything's going to happen. And that's kind of that dream place that I was talking about earlier. So what we do for this is we use traffic lights. So basically, we have a system where if something's green, everything's cool. If it's orange or amber, it's bad. We need to look at it. If it's red, it's like panic stations. Everybody drop what they're doing, figure out what's red. And that's how we do it. And what that's done is it's liberated us from having to look at all the data all the time. We only look at one or two pieces of data. And what it means is that when our team has ownership of those KPIs and the KPI goes red in the traffic light, they start looking at the problems first instead of me. And then they come to me and say, hey, I figured out what the problem is. We need to change it. And that's liberating, because now I don't have to do that myself all the time. What this means, though, is that you've got to dig into your numbers. So how many of you understand your numbers front to back intimately every single day? How many of you can recite your conversion rate? How many of you know how many people you need to get into your sales funnel in order to get a sale out at the bottom? How many of you know what your conversion rate was six months ago, what it is today? How many people know what your bounce rate is? What's your average order value? How many items do you need to ship to a certain part of the country in order for you to have a distribution center in that part of the country? How many of you know how much it costs for a van to be in a certain part of the country for you to be able to afford that van so that it's not a cost for you and it's actually a, a revenue generator? These are the things that I'm starting to realize are absolutely important for us to progress as a business because every single day I'm having conversations with people about these numbers and if I don't know what they are, I can't make decisions and I have to go and review the numbers all the time. So what I'm trying to do is create this place where the numbers are easy to see, and when you have conversations, you just refer to those numbers. Does that make sense? I hope I'm not talking too fast. So what you've got to do when you dig into the numbers is you've got to review your team decisions and make sure that they're making those decisions, but you have to let them own those outcomes. right? So if they make a decision and they cock up, you've got to make sure that they own that cock up. Because when they feel the pain of that cock-up, they're probably going to go back and do it differently next time. It sounds obvious, but if you do the whole thing front to back, so you figure out your KPIs, you pick them carefully, you give your team ownership and autonomy, you use traffic lights to figure out when there are problems, you dig into your numbers when you need to, and then you let your team own the outcomes, 
the magical secret sauce starts to happen and that they start to take ownership of those cock-ups and they come to you when there's a cock-up. And that's fantastic because that means that your process and your system is now independent of the business owner or you and it means it can work on its own. And that's kind of this nirvana place that we we're looking for. So I've got a couple more points here that are slightly off topic. I think these are the, you know, coming to the, the end of the do's um, part. So the first one is do remove ambiguity. So how many of you have ambiguity in your business? And by that I mean people don't really understand what they're supposed to do or they don't really understand what the data is supposed to tell them or they don't really understand what people's roles are. Does anybody have that? I've got that right now. We've just hired three new people. They all kind of work together and collaborate, but they don't really know where the rules are and where the boundaries are between them. So we're busy establishing that. But what that's doing is it's creating ambiguity about who owns a task or who owns a project, and that's creating friction. So we're trying to get rid of that. Does that make sense? So what you want to try and do is remove the ambiguity, and then on the flip side of that, you want to create enough data so that that ambiguity doesn't allow anybody to slip away from what they're supposed to do. If the data says it's X and their job is to do X, then everything's fine. If the data says it's Y and their job is to do X, then you've got a problem. Okay, and that removes that ambiguity. So the, the, the one scenario is a people problem and the second scenario is a data or a results problem. But the bottom line is you want to remove ambiguity wherever you can. The next thing is, is everything you look at in your business, you should say, how do we automate this? How do we make it faster? How can we move faster? How can we generate sales leads faster? How can we make our site faster? How can we deploy faster? Because ultimately what will happen is as you start making these things happen faster, you'll move further and further up the value chain and you'll start doing things which create more value in the business, which will lead to growth. If you don't do that, you'll stagnate and you'll plateau. And if you stagnate and plateau for too long, it's pretty hard to start pulling yourself out of that again. So generally speaking, how can you automate? How can you move faster? One of the key aspects of that, there's a book called The Checklist Manifesto. If you haven't read it, go and read it. It costs about seven or eight quid. Um, it's a really, really good read on how to create checklists that enable consistency. Okay? So if you're building a system or a process that allows you to automate something faster or allows you to, um, make, sorry, allows you to move faster as a team, one of the things that's going to help you to do that is creating a checklist for that process so that it can be repeated in exactly the same way every single time. So what we do is we have a, a project in Asana called Checklists, and it, whenever we want to do a big project, we go back to our checklist project, and we, we basically copy that into a new project and run through our task list. And every time we think of something new that needs to be improved in that process or in that system, we just add it to that checklist. So what's happened over a year and a half is that we've developed a really good set of checklists which help us not cock up big projects. And it's just because we've got the steps written down on a checklist, and it means that they're out of everybody's heads. The next thing you've got to do is you've got to train your team to do that, and that's harder. But if you can get them to start creating checklists on their own, that's going to mean that every time you do a project or every time you start doing a task, you don't have to worry about things screwing up because you know that the checklist has everything in it that needs to be done. And that's empowering. So a couple of don'ts. Uh, don't make assumptions. So I had an investor a couple of years ago. He, um, we were in a meeting, and I said, I made the assumption that, blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me quite sternly and he said, if you make an assumption, you make an ass out of you and me. Now, we were both going into a meeting where I was going to sell everybody on the board that I'd made an assumption and cocked something up. But the end result is that he looked bad because he had trusted me to make the right decision. So I'd made an assumption but made an ass out of him. And that was a pretty early lesson in don't make assumptions about stuff because when you do, more often than not, the assumption will be wrong. So check all your assumptions. Don't reinvent the wheel. Sounds obvious, right? But there's still people out there that are building time management systems for their teams. It's crazy, right? There's still people out there that are building sales funnel tools when they've got Salesforce. There's still people out there building servers when they could be using autom automated deployment tools. Don't do these things because they're going to cost you time, they're going to cost you money, and they're going to be more difficult to do than getting a specialist to do that. Don't try to own your own infrastructure. Just don't. Don't. Like, don't even think about it. Pay somebody else to own your infrastructure because guaranteed in today's world, they'll do a better job at owning your infrastructure than you will because you're not a specialist infrastructure person. They are. So let them own your infrastructure because the more complex your business becomes, the more load you handle, the more traffic you handle, the more different moving parts there are, the harder it's going to be to own that infrastructure and so the harder it's going to be for you to kind of
kind of manage that. So a couple of points here which are more personal, um, and these are things that I kind of crept into the slide deck this morning. Um, the first point is that at each point that you grow your business, your business is going to need to change. So you're going to need different systems. So don't make the assumption that the system you create today is going to be OK for your business in 18 months' time. It's probably not. It's going to have to change. And along with that, people are going to reach their limits. You're going to reach limits, right? So if you don't have people that can change and adapt and can change their limits, then your business will plateau. And that's a bad place to be. So what you want to do is you want to hire people who can grow and who can change. And the way I think about that is, is a very kind of simple slide here. Hire slow, fire fast. I find that incredibly difficult to do, but I'm learning how to be more ruthless about it. And I try and hire attitude over aptitude. So give me a person who wants to work hard and wants to learn over somebody who's incredibly talented any day of the week. Because that person who wants to learn and work hard will generally be easier to work with and will achieve more than the person who's incredibly talented but lazy and doesn't get along with the rest of the team. So that's really, really important. And that's going to help you scale more than um, systems. And then lastly, it takes time. It really does. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't build Rome in a day. So don't beat yourself up when things go wrong. Just keep going. And at the end of the day, keep calm and have a beer. And that's it. Thanks very much, guys. <laughs>